Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art remotely, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, and this is the 150th episode. We're here. How's that possible? Time. Time, time. time moved. Almost three, almost three years. Time marches on. So, yeah. So, thanks thanks to everybody who has been, uh, you know, even if you're just joining us for the first time, thank you. But especially thanks to uh, thanks to those of you who have been following us for very close to three years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll be coming up on that three-year anniversary in September. Mm-hmm. Boop, 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 boop. Thanks, thanks to the team here. I mean, our, our, our researchers, I mean, Sophie, Olivia, and Sarah have been so helpful uh, as far as like, you know, I, I worried for a while there. Are there going to be enough stories? There's enough. There are so many. Mm-hmm. There are so many. And it's like the more you dig, uh, the, the the big like bigger caches you find of like, oh my God, there's a 50 extra stories over here and 100 extra stories over there. So mm-hmm. not worried about running out. Okay. Well, that's good. Me mm-hmm. either. Yeah. And the fans seem to continue to send so many stories in, which is so awesome. It is really cool. And uh, we have a couple stories to tell everyone today, but first, uh, Lindsay will handle announcement duties again. Okay. Again. Look at Dan shirking his duties off on me. <laughs> uh, as a reminder that uh, we record in advance, and so we don't yet have this month's total on the charity donation, but uh, we did want to donate to the victims and their families of the recent mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde. And that said, we knew it would be a challenge to pick one or the other. So we decided to donate to the National Compassion Fund, whose mission is to give funds to the victims of mass casualty crimes, such as mass shootings and terrorist attacks. And we will know the amount of that donation here in the coming weeks. Like I said, we're recording in advance. But in the meantime, if you'd like to learn more or donate yourself, you can visit nationalcompassion.org. And then also, I have this week's merch book, announcement. Book, 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 book. Uh, yes. Okay. So you are hearing this episode, which is going to come out on July 19th. If you're hearing this, you need to hustle your little tushy on over to badmagicmerch.com and get your book because the presale does end on August 8th. And depending on how many books we sell during the presale, we may not have any books left to put back in the store later this fall. So go, go, go. Get there. It's a limited number of books. There is a reprint of Volume 1 and Volume 2 as well. Mm -hmm. So get your hands on those books. Do it now. It's the only way we can guarantee you get a book. And it's the only way we can guarantee that if you do order a book, you get it in time for the spoopiest day of the year, Halloween, which is like the whole purpose to sit around the campfire and try and scare your friends. So head on over to badmagicmerch.com and uh, big props to Logan for again making that book look so beautiful it is just another stunning piece of artwork if nothing else and thanks to everyone who sent in stories just uh, such a cool project <laughs> not, i just sit here i'm like i wrote that book <laughs> i made all those stories up i am those characters could you imagine uh, no how many fan stories uh do you have today to share two three one i have four i have 22 22 and i have two fan stories this week back okay. to my regular schedule uh i have a fan story of a visit to the crescent hotel Mm -hmm. so we're gonna go back to arkansas as i like to say it yep we were there in maybe in year one it was it was early in scared to death when we visited the crescent hotel Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then just a couple episodes back i also had a fan story from arkansas just not Mm -hmm. from the bud moore place if that rings a bell to anybody down there and then my second story uh takes us to kenya which I think is cool. My fans mm-hmm. all around the world. I love hearing about different cultures, folklores, yeah. and what their beliefs are. Uh, and a very peculiar tale of foreboding dreams. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think, of course, it is funny how like cool, interesting, and wild. It's like I try so hard not to say it, but I'm like, try it's harder. the best adjective. Um, <laughs> but we have been to Kenya, I think, once before too. Uh, maybe, yeah. We're mm-hmm. going to go to Nairobi this time. Oh, we've been to Nairobi before. When one did, for when one story. We've been there, I don't know, six months ago, nine months ago. We went visited a story of some haunted house there. I was I was like insinuating that you went there without me. That's no, fine. I'd love to go. I'd love to go uh one of these days. 
one of these days. Um, okay, so I have my standard uh, two stories. You don't say. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, a little more traditional, I think packed with a lot of good scares. Uh, one is very strange. Uh, the first is a story of Lake Morena Campground in Campo, California, an okay. area of the outdoors that has been rumored to have been haunted for decades. I'll share some lore and a, a pretty intense modern encounter story. Okay, love that. Uh, the second story is the Sorcerers of Chiloé. In 1880, on the island of Chiloé, uh, actually on an archipelago of islands off the coast of Chile, several residents were convicted of belonging to a secret society of warlocks using black magic to intimidate and, in some cases, even murder. The trial uncovered uh, some very strange local lore involving monsters, wizard duels, a ghost ship, and more. Okay, but that sounds like fun. It's it's a very entertaining story. Okay. Very interesting little um, piece of history. And uh, all of our stories require to suspend disbelief to really get in and enjoy them. Uh, this one, if you're to believe it, requires you to take most of your critical thinking ability, <laughs> if not all of it, just kind of crumple it up into a ball, okay. throw it on the ground, stomp it flat, and then just throw it in a fire. Okay. Uh, but even if you don't believe it, like I said, I think you'll I think you'll find it very entertaining. Well, I love a little mix it up kind of yeah, story. Some interesting lore, some horror yeah. horror lore. Wild, cool, interesting. <laughs> Fair amount of setup on the first one. Are you are you ready to begin, or do you need to show us your socks? I got to show you my socks. Um, I'm celebrating Christmas in July, just okay. so you know. So I'm doing some little mm. reindeer slipper guys, and I just thought they were so cute. <laughs> nice. They're pretty funny. <laughs> and I have 20 Layla's on my desk right now. It looks like one is face down, which is concerning. Is she doing something mm, to another Layla? No, she just The oh, Layla's are scared. pure. Don't, don't make them do them, naughty things. A couple of them are face down. Whoa. So many Layla's. One's head hanging on by a pin out there in front. She but, had a little bit of surgery. <laughs> thanks for sending all those. I, they are cool looking. They're so cute. I, you guys, again, I said it last week. Last week. I said it four hours ago when we recorded last week's episode. <laughs> That's why we're wearing the same clothes. Um, I want a full desk of Layla's. So send them in. The, the P.O. <laughs> box is uh, listed in the episode description. If you have the means and the funds and the desire, I would love to just cover this desk in Layla's. I just think it would be the funniest thing. I don't even know where people get these Layla's. Well, they'll figure it out because I don't know either. <laughs> somebody somebody figured thanks, it out. Thanks to anyone who has sent one. It's very nice and unnecessary and it's very funny. It is very funny at this point. It smells great over here too. They smell good. Oh, I hate the way they smell. Okay, so here we go with the, with the campground. Okay. So time to be scared of camping again. Great. Lake Marina Campground located in Campo, California is a family-friendly camping destination with a lot of amenities. The park has roughly eight miles of hiking trails, kids' trails, a pavilion, a corporate meeting space, and a playground. It's near the start of the famous Pacific Crest Trail, making it a great place for hikers moving along some or all of that 2,653-mile behemoth to stop for the night. Our friend Jeff just did that last year. Yep, that is insane. Uh, There is RV sites, campsites, and even small cabins available for rent if you'd rather glamp than go traditional camping. There's also, according to four decades of lore, more than the average amount of paranormal terror to encounter if that appeals to you. Numerous visitors have fled in fear after their relaxing camping trip was interrupted by paranormal activity. For the past 40 years, campers and park rangers alike have reported a variety of unexplained phenomena from around the park. This was all brought to light at least documentation-wise, for the first time in an October 26, 1983 San Diego Union article titled More Than Fish Haunt Lake Morena. According to writer Helen Schaefer, Walter Stucker, a park volunteer, was woken up one night by what appeared to be a tall man standing outside his RV window. The man was wearing a dark coat and a knitted cap. They stared at one another for a moment before the man turned and walked towards the lake. Stucker reported, There wasn't a full moon, but it was light enough to see clearly. The man was taking very deliberate steps, but it seemed to me his feet weren't touching the ground. They appeared to be about six or seven inches above the surface. And then before the man made it to the lake shore, he faded into nothing. Park volunteers and rangers told the union about hearing disembodied footsteps around their campsites, or like Stucker, seeing the apparition of an elderly man in their periphery. Ranger Tracy Walker also reported seeing ghosts at the park prior to that article. While working in a back office at the station, he heard footsteps outside. He stopped working to check the noise out, and then, as it was written in the article, Before I could do that, the steps accelerated, came around to the side door, maybe 12 feet from me, and they stopped right there. There There's a wooden lintel that extends under the door, inside, and under the door, inside and outside. It creaked and moved up and down, and the doorknob turned once. Walker called in his wife to come to the door, thinking it was crazy, but then they both heard steps, and both saw the lintel move again. 
On another occasion, when the park dam keeper once hosted a relative in his house, the guest woke up in the middle of the night and saw a baby's christening gown float towards her. It brushed her cheek and then disappeared. So strange. Many other park guests have said they've seen floating figures, heard footsteps, even seen a woman in a white dress standing at the lake shoreline. And these experiences have continued for decades since the publication of that article in 1983. One Reddit thread from a year ago is full of users posting about all sorts of strange experiences, experiences like these at the park. The following account is a report of one family of campers who reported having their vacation deeply disturbed by unexplained phenomena. Time now for the tale of the faceless man. Angela couldn't believe they were doing this. Instead of spending Memorial Day weekend relaxing by a poolside, they were camping. Angela's mind flashed back to her conversation with her husband, Jamie, a week before, where he tried to convince her that the trip would actually be glamping. There's a store, showers, a ranger station. A town is a short drive away. There's going to be so many families there, he said. It's more like a theme park than an actual campground. Angela agreed to it when her daughter Eleanor had looked at her excitedly and begged if they could all go camping and fishing together. Angela knew that she hadn't always been so great at compromising and making sacrifices. Jamie had always loved the outdoors and spent most of their weekends trying to talk her into going hiking, fishing, or camping. And she usually said no. Even though he'd managed to make Ellie love everything nature-related, now it was always two against one when it came to picking family activities. In her defense, every time she agreed to an outdoor activity, something seemed to go wrong. When she agreed to take an easy family hike, she fell and sprained her ankle. When she agreed to go fishing, she somehow stepped on the edge of some kind of large, jagged fish hook and had to go to urgent care to get stitches. Then the last time they went camping and tried to make s'mores, she caught the edge of her shirt sleeve on fire and burned her wrist. It seemed like the universe was continually telling her not to go camping, maybe not even go outside. But after carefully looking at different websites, Google reviews, and photos, Angela was the one who ended up booking a spot at Lake Morena Campground. And now, here they were. Also now, she was trying her best not to regret her decision. The place was packed with families. Angela saw plenty of other moms like herself. If they could go camping for a weekend and seem to enjoy themselves, she could too, right? But still, she wasn't thrilled. Once they unloaded their things, Jamie and Ellie set up a tent together. Angela busied herself making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for all three of them. She knew she'd just be in the way if she tried to help with any actual gear. The trio ate lunch together for about an hour, then Jamie decided to go to the office to rent a boat for the weekend. Angela and Ellie headed to one of the kids' trails for a short walk while he sorted all that out. Be very careful, Mommy, Ellie said, taking Angela's hand. (laughs) You don't want to trip and fall. I can't believe my seven-year-old is holding onto my hand and guiding me on a walk. This should be the other way around, Angela grumbled internally. They made it to the end of the trail without any incident. Then they found Jamie, who announced that he had the boat secured and they'd spend the day fishing tomorrow. Ellie spent the late afternoon on the playground with a group of kids her age who had kindly invited her to play tag with them. While she played, Jamie used one of the campground's grills to make burgers for everyone for dinner. And then they ended the night by laying on the ground in their sleeping bags, stargazing until Ellie fell asleep. So far, so good. Better than good, actually. So far, it had been pretty wonderful. Angela marveled at the fact that she was actually enjoying herself. But then that enjoyment quickly wore off when she woke up the next morning. She immediately missed her normal morning routine, specifically her espresso machine and her oat milk. The drip coffee and creamer packets from the campground store just weren't doing it for her. She also missed her bed and her shower, and she could go on and on. Jamie and Ellie buzzed around with excitement while they packed up their fishing gear. Angela was nervous. She hadn't been on a boat since the fish hook incident. Fortunately, the morning passed uneventfully. Angela actually managed to catch a small rainbow trout which she promptly released back into the lake, feeling a little bad for hooking the small creature and then wondering if it would be okay as it swam away. After lunch, the three of them went on another walk on the kids' trails. That was when things started to take a turn for the worse. Mommy, do you see that man over there? Angela quickly turned her head and saw Ellie pointing somewhere off in the distance. Don't point, that's rude, she admonished her daughter, looking in the direction of her daughter's hand. Ellie was pointing towards the woods just off the trail. There's no one there. Ellie shrugged. I saw him walking through the woods. He was so tall. How could he be hiding? He stared at me and kept walking. He was weird. Angela was a bit concerned now. She asked her daughter for more details about what the man looked like. and Ellie said that he wore a black suit. She and Jamie spent the rest of the walk scanning for a tall man in black clothing. It wasn't like Ellie to make up something like that. But they never saw anyone who fit her description. Angela tried to push down her worried feelings. She figured he was probably just some solo hiko. Solo? hiker 
and that he had just as much right to be here as they did. Still, she didn't like how he'd vanished, so she continued to keep her eyes out for anything unusual. The three of them spent the evening at a bonfire that one of Jamie's new friends invited him to. Angela loved how Jamie had the ability to make new friends wherever he went. It was another pretty perfect evening, or it would have been if Angela could just relax. She tried to join in the conversation, but her eyes were constantly scanning the edge of the woods, looking for something. The man, maybe? Why would he come back to see them? Her anxiety increased as it turned dark. It wasn't until after 10 p.m. when they finally returned to their tent to sleep. A ball of worry had really settled into the pit of Angela's stomach by then, and she couldn't sleep. Ever since Ellie had mentioned the man, she couldn't shake the terrible feeling that something bad was going to happen. She just didn't know what. Angela had slept easily the night before, but now all she could think about was the fact that there was nothing between them and outside but a thin scrap of fabric. After what seemed like hours of worrying, Angela fell asleep, but she wouldn't stay sleeping for long. She jolted awake, alerted by the distinct sense of wrongness. Her eyes shifted down, and then complete panic and adrenaline surged through her. Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. Ellie wasn't in the tent. Before she went into full-blown panic mode, she quickly leaned over, swept her arms around the tent floor, feeling for any child-sized lumps in the blankets. Nothing. Oh, my God. Angela then saw that the tent was partially unzipped, just enough space for someone Ellie's size to fit through. She shook Jamie roughly. His eyes snapped open as she screamed, Ellie's gone! Jamie sat up ranrod straight, straight. Even though he had been in a deep sleep only a few seconds before, he was now instantly alert and ready. He grabbed two flashlights and passed one to Angela, saying, We'll split up to the left and to the right. If we can't find her in five minutes, we run to the ranger station and tell them. Angela nodded, trying to control her panicked breathing as they crawled out of the tent and split off in different directions. She needed to calm down. Panicking was not going to help them find her daughter. Tears were already welling in her eyes and blurring her vision. She took a deep breath before calling out, Ellie! Ellie, are you here? No answer. Angela continued walking forward, trying to control the terror that was increasing every second. Every time she'd been scared or worried paled in comparison to this. This was by far the worst moment of her, of her entire life. She called again, Ellie! She checked her watch, three minutes. Just a little more time before she had to meet Jamie. They were going to have to go to the ranger station and report their daughter missing. She couldn't believe this was actually happening. Angela choked down a panicked sob. She fought thoughts of the man in black, the tall man. What was he doing to her daughter right now? Angela started walking back to the tent, tears now spilling from the corners of her eyes. All she could think about was the man Ellie had mentioned. All sorts of horrifying possibilities continued to run through her head, Angela doing her best to stubbornly refuse to acknowledge them. But she couldn't. So many horrifying possibilities could now be all too real. She passed by the small beach and paused. There was a woman standing at the water's edge. Angela shook her head, not able to believe what she was seeing. The woman was white, almost see-through, and floating a few inches off the ground. Was she hallucinating? Angela stared at the woman, too stunned to say anything. The woman stared back, a serene expression on her face. Oddly, Angela felt a sense of calm wash over her. Her heartbeat slowed. The panic subsided just for a moment, and she felt like maybe everything would be okay. But it wasn't okay because Ellie was still gone. Maybe the stress was causing her to hallucinate. She was making up this vision in her head to force a sense of calm. Angela felt the urge to ask the woman, Have you seen my daughter? The woman didn't speak. Instead, she turned her head ever slightly to the right, where Angela had just come from, and stared off into the woods. Angela had a feeling she was telling her something, but wasn't able to voice the words, and Angela checked her watch. She had one minute left. Acting on a gut feeling, she ran into the woods in the direction of the apparition stare, calling Ellie's name. Ellie! Her panic was back and worse than ever. What if she found her? What if she wasn't alive? Tears continued to flow. She had to fight constant sobs as she continued to call for her daughter. Mommy! A quiet voice came from her left. Angela jumped, startled, saw her daughter looking up at her safe and unharmed. The relief was so strong, she fell to her knees, wrapped her arms around Ellie, and wept. When she was able to control her crying, a few moments later she asked, Are you okay? Are you hurt? Why did you leave the tent? Ellie just seemed confused and said in a small, frightened voice, I, I don't know. I went to sleep next to you, and then when I woke up, I was here. I was so scared. I, I thought I was lost. Nobody would find me. Ellie now broke down into her own sobs. Angela scooped her daughter up and ran back to their tent, calling for Jamie. She noticed that the white woman was gone, but didn't have time or energy to think about it at that moment. Jamie picked Ellie up and began crying himself when he saw that she was okay. Everyone was now in tears. Thankfully, tears of relief. Angela noticed that a park ranger was standing by their tent, and a group of other people were nearby. Jamie shouted to woken them all up, and in a few minutes, he had half the camp looking for Ellie. The park ranger had just happened to be walking through the area and was about to call in a search party. She didn't make an official report, but she listened to Angela and Jamie when they explained what happened, and she told them, My son sleepwalks. It, it didn't start until he was a little older. 
I think that's what might have happened. Angela was relieved that there was a rational explanation for Ellie's behavior, or at least maybe a rational explanation. But what about the woman at the lake? Was there a rational explanation for her? Angela still wasn't sure if she was real or some sort of hallucination brought on by her panicked and desperate state. Or maybe she was a ghost. She decided to tell Jamie about it later, once they got home. Right now, they continued questioning Ellie about what happened. Her daughter didn't remember anything until that moment, the moment that Angela had found her. And she seemed upset that she'd made her parents so worried. Angela decided they would have to talk to the pediatrician about sleepwalking when they got back home. Angela asked Ellie about the man in black clothes, but she promised that she didn't see him or anyone else suspicious when she was outside. Jamie was now the one who decided their camping trip was over. He packed up their things. They drove away from the campsite in the middle of the night. On their way out, they drove past the boat docking station. Ellie broke the silence, asking, Who's that? Angela looked over. She was there, barely visible from such a distance, but still there nonetheless. Although she was far away, Angela felt like the woman was giving her a knowing stare. No one, sweetie. Just a trick of light, Angela, Angela lied. She, would tell, she could tell from Jamie's face that he didn't believe her. I'll tell you later, she whispered. Jamie nodded and drove them out of the campsite. Angela felt relief began to set in when they were passing the entrance to the campsite. She was smiling, but then she looked back in the rearview mirror and saw the man in black. He was sitting in the back seat, his arm around her daughter, his face, no features, no mouth, nose, eyes, but it somehow still had an expression, one of hate and malevolence. Angela screamed, causing Jamie to swerve, almost drive off the road. Angela spun around and saw her daughter looking terrified, but not because of the man. He was nowhere to be seen now. She was scared because of her mother's screaming and the erratic swerving. Jamie asked her, of course, what was wrong? And she didn't tell him, not with Angela able to hear. She apologized and said that she was just still upset from feeling panicked earlier and thought she'd seen someone behind the car, but it was only some shadows. She tried to play it off like she wasn't scared anymore, that she'd be better now. But would she? Would she ever be? Now knowing that they might be bringing that thing home with them, what might it do without the woman by the lake around to help them? My God. That is a terrifying tale. I literally cried. Oh my God. <laughs> It was like every parent's worst nightmare. I know I couldn't look at you. I know, I'm I was... sorry. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry not sorry. No, yeah, no, no. That is like, yeah. I kind of felt like that's where it was going to. Because I was like, oh God. Like yeah. that, that is a fear when you go camping with a child. Yes. Because kids, kids are dumb. I mean, mm -hmm. let's just have it out. They're just <laughs> dumb because yeah, their they, brains aren't developed. Exactly. And they, yes, they have a sense of right and wrong and all of that that, you know, you're instilling in them. But like they're, they're curious little critters. Mm -hmm. They hear something. I mean, kids do st stupid, stupid stuff like, well, I just, I heard some big kids. They were still right? up. I wanted to be up. I'm a big kid. Like yep. it's any number of things that could cause a kid to get up and leave a tent, even though. In their heart of hearts, they know they shouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, or they have to pee. Yep, or, don't want to you know, wake somebody up. Yeah, but yep. I don't want to get in trouble, you know, because at home they would get in trouble. You know, all these. So Sneak it's like, a bit of candy. Something. Yeah. So camping is like, yeah. oh, man, I can't believe we never locked, like, like zip tied our tent shut or anything for our kids. I think we would. I think we would kind of sleep in a way that like they would have to walk over us or, or step on us almost to get out the entrance. The way you kind of lay there. You know, yeah. They, they want to, I mean, it would, it would have been hard for them to get out. Yeah. And, and I think we made a pretty good like deal of like, hey, because there, there's bears. There could be like, all, like you could get eaten alive. Kind of scare them a little bit. Yeah, I think we scared. And then as they got a little bit older and then we had Penny and or we had yeah Penny, not Gigi yet. And then eventually Gigi. It's like yeah. there's no way they were leaving the tent without the dogs getting yeah. up. Uh, like yeah but yep. still mm -hmm. i know uh, but also like you don't want them to live their whole lives in fear of adventure yeah and camping is so cool and so fun and freeing and oh my mm -hmm. god but what the man in the back seat holy shit balls <laughs> that was not a twist i saw coming yeek the the lady by the lake i thought it was like a good job mom you got your baby back i helped you i saved you didn't expect him to uh still be with them yeah. And who who knows what happened when they got home? Ichi Wawa. <laughs> I have a few pictures. <gasps> My God. That was an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> uh, the first is Lake Morena. Do you think it's too early to be drinking? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like a, a kind of a deserty landscape, you know, somewhat around the lake. Uh-huh. I could see uh, like why camping there would be fun. It reminds me a little bit of the area we would go camping with the kids a couple summers. Uh, Lake Kuyamaka. Kuyamaka, that's right. Just as far as it's, you know, it's not far from there actually. So it's oh, really? the same kind of like oh, landscape. Oh man, I loved that place. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, it was so love, I love the sweet. memories we had from that place. Shit fishing and horrible to sleep because it got so hot when we went. Remember that? 
Was and that? We, we drove home one night early because it was so, we were like sweating to death in the tent. Was that Kuyamaka or was that? That was Kuyamaka. That was two plus two is five. That was that night. <laughs> My God, that's right. Monroe. Mm-hmm. I know stuff. I know. I know. I'm good at math. Two plus two is five. Two plus two is five. Duh. Oh, I have a picture of her in the tent, like at that specific age. That (laughs) nut. Yep. Uh, This next one is part of the campground near Lake Morena. Oh, you get a little cabin. Nice little glamp cabin. Come on, take me there. And then this uh, last that reminds pic- me of, oh, you've never camped at El Capitan. I have, but not glamped. Yeah, I, I went to that campsite. Oh, yeah, with Tracy, maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but just like. Damn t- her. <laughs> just kidding. Rest your soul, Tracy. But just tent camping. Yeah. Yeah, which is, I am sure, a very different experience. Yeah. Well, I was only there for one night with a girlfriend, so. Yeah, yeah. Also different. Uh, this is last one. is still from a uh, old 1950 Mexican horror movie oh. called The Man Without a Face. That that looks like a very scary movie. I know. I'm mean, interested. It, 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 apparently, like reading a little bit more about, it, I've never seen it. But it was like a surrealist, um, uh, cool. yeah, like yeah, 1950 Mexican cinema, like very just weird and. That's how we get Kyler to like horror films. Oh yeah, get him in the art house stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Isn't there now not related to that movie? Mm-hmm. Isn't there a Mel Gibson movie like The Man with No Face? Am I making that up? Do you have your phone in here? I think there is a Mel Gibson movie called The Man with something about face. Yeah, like I know that's so silly, but I'm not going to be able to move on from it unless you Google it. Okay, so so, so Mel Gibson and fans then, play along. Everybody, get out your Google. Man, oh wait, yeah, yeah, Mel Gibson. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh, I never saw that. 1993, man, the man without a face. Yeah, can, Mel I, can I see what it looks like? Um, yes. Sorry, guys. It was a guy just like his face is badly scarred. Oh yeah. And I'm guessing it's about him having some kind of. I don't know. Romance. Uh, let's see. Accident. Um, based on some novel. Um, but what is it about? Why does the guy not have a face? Irrelevant. He's been a reclusive painter for the past seven years following a car accident that left his disfigured on the right side of his face. Hmm. Yeah. I just When you said man with no face, that was not what I was expecting yeah, to not- pop up there. I was like, <laughs> uh, why are we talking about Mel Gibson right now? <laughs> He's not somebody we talk about. Uh, now that we're out of the dark in spooky woods. Oh, that was like, you really did me in. Good. That's, oh. that's, that's, that's the goal. To get better at storytelling and make it a roller coaster. It was really good. The fact that I cried was like, <laughs> I, that, that was unexpected. I uh, just was like picturing little baby Momo. I know. I know. It was Ugh. too much. I didn't yep. like it. Mm-hmm. You should give me some sort of warning. <laughs> uh, we time, time not ahead. Logan, did you cry? <laughs> I almost did when I saw you. <laughs> I know. That's what That's what I'm like. like don't look. Don't look. Because I was starting to get emotional. Oh, God. Uh, time to head way down to the, just off the coast of Chile for a very strange tale of sorcerers and monsters. Okay. Let's get weird now. Very weird. You're going to have to focus a bit more than uh, with the normal story to follow along with this uh, this madness. Okay. I but might, I, since it since it's like less scary and more. It's just interesting. Bizarre. I might, if it's hard to follow, there may be a moment or two where I have to interject of like, wait, what? Absolutely. Okay. I had, this is the one I had to stop on last night and be like, I'm too tired. Okay. And okay. I had, to, I had to reboot my brain today. Um, so Chiloé is the largest island off the, uh, largest island and part of the Chile archipelago located off the coast of Chile. Uh, ancient Incas believed the ocean just belong, just beyond these islands was cursed and the source of all evil. And the Mapuche, the original people of South Central Chile and Argentina who first settled Chiloé long before the Spanish arrived, also worried greatly about evil forces in the area. Their history of the island is shrouded in unusual mythology centered mainly around tales of black magic. Los Brujos de Chiloé, or the Warlocks of Chiloé, are a group heavily mentioned in local folklore. These warlocks, according to legend, once lived all over the archipelago of Chiloé and were proficient in black magic. And they supposedly will go on to form a secret magical society, La Recta Provincia. According to the ancient mythology of La Recta Provincia, there are calcus, sorcerers or witches who use black magic, benevolent forces generally referred to as machi. El El Calueche is the name of a ghost ship that occasionally sails near the island that is supposed to carry wizards, dead sailors, and illicit goods. The Imbuche are a particularly disturbing group of monsters that hide on the island in caves guarding these wizards. Their heads, arms, fingers, noses, mouths, and ears are all twisted backwards. Somewhat humanoid in shape, they certainly do not appear human and are covered in blue skin and sharp teeth. According to the strange lore, an embuche starts off as a firstborn child, less than nine days old, who has been kidnapped and then sold to a brujo, a.k.a. a sorcerer. The brujo then transforms the child into a monster, 
feeding it a diet of black cat's milk and goat flesh until it's large and strong. Once grown, the Mbuche are trained to eat rotting human flesh and bones from cemeteries. The Mbuche is a monster raised to be used as a tool for revenge and curses and to protect the Kalkus. Europeans first heard of these monsters shortly after arriving in Chiloé in 1567. The island would eventually become part of Chile after a revolt against the Spanish. The origin of La Recta Provincia, an actual society of witches and warlocks, supposedly dates to 1786 when navigator José de Moralda visited Chiloé. According to local lore, Mor Moraleda, there we go, uh, José de Moraleda, de Moraleda quickly ended up challenging a local sorceress known as Chilpilla to a magic competition. Chilpilla defeated Mor Moraleda in a duel involving witchcraft and received a book of European magic as a reward, then uh, shared Mor Moraleda's book of magic with the indigenous people of the islands. And then this led to a union of indigenous rituals and magical practices from Europe described in the given book, which then gave rise to the La Recta Provincia. The Recta Provincia would be led by a king and a governing, governing council. The seat of the king was in a cave. Also in the cave was a secret society of brujos, their magic guarded by the Mbuche. Here in this cave, they continued to study magic and grow more powerful. The brujos learned how to transform into animals. They learned how to harm people with magic from great distances. They brewed various harmful potions, and they learned how to board the ghost ship Calueche. As crazy as all this shit sounds, in 1880, <laughs> some Chilean authorities were so worried about La Recta Provincia, they put some alleged warlocks in this group on trial, fearing that their secret <laughs> yeah, it's in more intense, fearing that their secret society was about to try and take over the islands. Time now for the tale of the dark sorcerers of Chiloé. Island governor Luis Rodriguez uh, Martiniano, Mar Marti Martiniano. It ordered the investigation that led to the trial. He found out about the Brujos after he issued decrees ordering the arrest of army deserters during the War of the Pacific. And he came to believe that some of the islanders were sheltering these sorcerers. And it's possible that some men claiming to be warlocks were actually being sheltered, uh, had actually been put in positions of power on the island because the Mapuche did believe in them and also they did resist Spanish rule. They'd already been turned, uh, turning to supposed warlocks for help in getting revenge or solving disputes possibly for centuries. The 1880 trial would be one of the last major witch trials in the history of the world. At the trial, accused brujos admitted to running protection rackets and killing enemies by poison or magic. The accused did, in fact, claim to belong to the secret organization known as La Recta Provincia. British traveler Bruce Chatwin wrote in a travel book in Patagonia in 1977 that contained a lot of info about Chiloé, and in this book, he included some of the 1880 trial testimony, translated into English for the first time. The testimony had been originally preserved by Chilean historian Benjamin Vacuña McKenna when it occurred in 1880. One of the most important trial witnesses was a 70-year-old farmer named Mateo Consuecar. He admitted to being a member of La Recta Provincia for more than 20 years. He testified that the society had numerous members who acted as kings and viceroys and were based in a large cave. He said this cave was hidden outside the village of Quicavi and was guarded by monsters who protected a book of magic and a magical bowl that allowed hidden secrets to be revealed. Uh, Mateo testified 20 years ago, when Jose Merriman was king, he said he was ordered to go to the cave with meat for some animals that lived inside. He complied with the order, took them the meat of a kid he had slaughtered. I believe goat in that sense. Okay. Merriman went with him, and when they reached the cave, he started dancing about like a sorcerer, quickly opened the entryway. This was covered over with a layer of earth and grass to keep it hidden, and under this was a piece of metal, the alchemy key. He used this to open the entryway and then faced, it was faced with two completely disfigured beings, which burst out of the gloom and rushed towards him. One looked like a goat, for it dragged itself along on four legs. The other was a naked, twisted man with a completely white beard and hair down to his waist. Mateo claimed he encountered these monsters in 1860. He called the goat monster a chivato and the other the Mbuche. Chatwin, the British traveler and author, further described the Mbuche in his account of the cult's testimony. When the sect needs a new Mbuche, the council of the cave orders a member to steal a boy child from six months to a year old. So said another lore to be less than nine days. The deformer, a permanent resident of the cave, starts work at once. He disjoints the arms and legs and the hands and feet. Then begins the delicate task of altering the position of the head. Day after day, for hours at a stretch, he twists the head with a tourniquet until it is rotated through an angle of 180 degrees. That is until the child can look straight down the line of its own vertebrae. There remains one last operation for which another specialist is needed. 
At full moon, the child is laid on a workbench, lashed down with its head covered in a bag. The specialist cuts a deep incision under the right shoulder blade. Into the hole, he inserts the right arm and sews up the wound with thread taken from the neck of an ewe. Of an, of a ewe. Uh, when it's healed, the embuche is complete. Per testimony, the Chivato and embuche were fed human flesh and confined underground, and they couldn't speak, at least not any intelligible language. In the spring of 1880, based largely on Mateo's testimony, authorities looked for this cave for a full week but couldn't find it. Despite this, they did learn that Mateo was far from the only person to claim knowledge of La Recta Provincia. Uncovered accounts going back to the 18th century described the collection of protection money. Villagers would pay an annual tribute to the society to ensure they would have no accidents during the night. Villagers who refused to pay had their crops destroyed, sheep killed, allegedly by sorcery. It was believed that the Lorecta Provincia had magical stones that gave them power to curse their enemies. Mysterious deaths had been occurring for many years in the area attributed to these supposed sorcerers. It would be a series of poisonings that would get the attention of authorities in 1880. The warlocks claimed that using a special sword, they could fly, and that by wearing a special coat, they could float. New recruits had to create their own magical instruments. According to Chatwin, they did this by digging up and skinning a corpse. Chatwin also wrote, The human grease remaining in the skin gives off a spot of phosphorescence, which lights the members' nocturnal expeditions. Other supposed wizards testified that when they joined the society, they were required to strap a small lizard to their heads. These lizards would give them knowledge. <laughs> This is crazy. <laughs> Such as how to transform into animals. Oh, knowledge and Nimrod. And how to unlock doors. Oh, my gosh. Uh, initiates were also believed to ride magical seahorses to board the Calweche, <laughs> the ghost ship. They're saying this in a trial. <laughs> the Calweche mostly traveled underwater and only surfaced to unload contraband for island merchants, which was a main source of income for the warlocks. New initiates to Lorecta Provincia had to bathe in a freezing river for 15 nights to wash away their Christian baptism. They may have also had to murder a friend or relative to prove that they had cleansed themselves of human sentiment. Then they had to remove their clothing and run around the island three times, calling out to Satan. New initiates could then enter, it's very specific, new initiates could then enter the magic cove, see the secret book, and meet the secret elders. And they would celebrate their initiation with a great feast consisting of human flesh. The warlocks also testified that when they needed spies or messengers, they kidnapped young girls and forced them to drink a combination of wolf oil and natri, a fruit on the island. The drink made young girls vomit up their intestines. They would then turn into large birds whose calls were extremely unpleasant. The girls would return with their when their task was done, eat their intestines back, and then transform into humans once again. Uh huh. Another witness at the 1880 trial was Jose Aro, a Mapuche carpenter. Aro claimed he was ordered to kill Francesco and Maria Cardenas, a couple who had a falling out with uh, Matteo Con... Con oh man, Conwekar. He invited them for a drink and poisoned them with arsenic. And uh, Jose believed the potion was made with magic. Two supposed members of this group were sentenced to 15 years in prison for manslaughter. Ten more were convicted of being members of an unlawful society. Mateo received a three-year sentence, his brother a year and a half sentence, and many of the sentences were later overturned on appeals, but not all of them. The trial diminished the society's power over the island residents, but fear of the brujos and their secret society remains until the present. Today, fewer than 200,000 people live on the main island, and many of them still fear the Brujos. Resident Juan Pablo Mancilla Espinosa, a travel guide, warned journalist Rachel Levitt, who published an article on the island for Fedora's Travel in 2017, saying, The family of the deceased must guard the grave for three days after death, or the wizards will dig up the corpse and steal the skin to make a coat for flying. Locals also continue to report seeing strange lights, hearing odd and terrifying noises, or experiencing worried feelings, all of which, to them at least, indicate that brujos are nearby. When asked what the brujos want, Juan Pablo answered, to make trouble. Juan Pablo warned Levitt, if you're hiking in the forest, never go so far that you can't hear the ocean. That's a sure sign a wizard is near. Juan Pablo also shared his own alleged recent encounter. He said that he, his wife, and his son went for a bicycle ride, saw an abandoned house for sale. When they stopped to take a look, a strange feeling about the place came over them, overwhelmed them, and they rode away quickly. But then on the ride home, they were overcome with extreme exhaustion, so much so that they pulled over, laid down on the road, and fell asleep. Pablo said, I will never step foot in that house again, not even near it, I know, but I, I know it is not sold. The mystery of Lorecta Provincia and their practices still fascinate people all over the world. Skeptics believe they're nothing more than a sort of mafia who con the islanders out of their money using fear tactics, while others believe the islands of Chiloé are home to ancient black magic that only warlocks 
can access. And I have a few pictures. Oh, we- I'm so <laughs> grateful that there are photographs to go along with this. You want me to show them before I we discuss? I have some notes. This first one is an illustration of the imbuche, the <laughs> twisted creature. See, the one arm's kind of sewed oh. into its back. Oh, yeah. No, I, I understood. It's not possible, but okay. Uh, another one, old photos of locals living on the island of Chilue, uh, Chiloé claiming to be warlock members of Lorecta Provincia. Okay, so just like, you know, like any other like native to the land, Mm -hmm. like following their own like folklore traditions. Mm -hmm. Yep. That doesn't seem crazy in any way. Random, this next one, random pick of some skeleton witches. Just shows up in an article about uh, these uh, mysterious warlocks. That's a creepy ass picture. I know it is. Uh, Next one, a picture of a a village on Chiloé. It does seem very beautiful there. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. If you told me that was like Norway, I also would have. Yeah. You know, believe like the that colorful just the houses. Color. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, this next one, picture of a map of Chiloé from the Wall Street Journal, so you can just kind of see where it lays there. That little, little red spot is Chiloé. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look like what's around it. Okay. And then lastly, just a recent pick of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Not sure how they fit into this, but Chili's in their name, and I know they're popular in Chile. Okay, well, there you have it. Just mm-hmm. everybody's ripped. Yep, everybody's still uh, pretty thin. Okay, well. There well, you go. Well, there you go. Hope everybody's clean and sober. Or, you know, enjoying themselves and still alive. <laughs> okay well that was something my friend uh the very first note i wrote was this is a fucked up harry potter <laughs> yeah it's like it's but like, then i was like wait a second did she research this like oh i'm sure i mean a lot of i will say like J.R. tolkien and you know um oh my god harry potter is jk rowling jk rowling thank you a lot of these like fantasy authors mm-hmm I mean, they tend to be very, very knowledgeable in folklore and stuff. Like, also, like, um, what's his name? George Martin, um, Game, uh, Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but a lot of those are, are like people are very are experts. Yeah. In uh, kind of international folklore, because you know you pull from these traditions, it kind of resonates with people in a different way because it's new but also familiar. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the imagination of this folk. I mean, the the, the lizards spe- on the heads. That's specificity it. of the lore of uh-huh. like it has to be twisted in this way, and you have to run around three times in the island. You have to, you know, but you're yelling Satan, and I know that I could not keep a straight face either when it was uh, you tie a lizard to your head, and that's how you learn <laughs> <laughs> how to shave shit. Like, like if I was, I just imagine. I know, but that's like I'm like, is that the OG lizard Illuminati? I, May, I just imagine that's how you get that. Like, right. That's how you do your research every week. You put a lizard on your head. <laughs> I, <laughs> I would just imagine like sitting in. Okay, you get to. The, what is it? The Mapuche. Uh, I'm trying to remember the uh, the name of the indigenous people who where this folklore comes out of. But I imagine I couldn't keep it straight. I imagine like um, yeah, Mapuche. Yeah, I imagine like you're sitting there and you're you know uh, it's a dark night and you know like in, outside some village they go to some traditional kind of hut from the ancestors and uh-huh. they're telling you the story uh-huh. and a lot of it is kind of scary. You know, like oh my god, I'm getting like the chills. Sure, I would. Like a, yeah, like a like an ominous tone to everything. And then when, like when he and like a straight face, maybe there's some drums beating, it's like really adding to the tension and everything. And then he talks about it, and then they tie the lizards to their head and that's how they could transform. I just picture being like. <laughs> Like, just, like, starting to bust up laughing and just ruining the mood. And then they rode in on seahorses. I know. It was that combination of lizard's side of the head with seahorse. I'm like, you could have left, left that out. That was the rough draft. <laughs> that was the rough draft of the folklore. And then you revise it. You're like, maybe maybe people aren't going to take us as seriously if we keep in the lizard and the seahorse details. <laughs> also, what is wolf oil? No idea. I don't even think it's a thing. Okay, because I was like, I don't understand. I, I mean, mean, there I could s- be oil from, I mean, some kind of oil from wolves. I don't know that. I don't know if there's wolves down there or not. Who knows? I guess maybe there was. Some maybe there was. Well, because I was thinking like, well, I guess you could dogs. get it from like their coat. Yeah. You know, you like, I'm, I'm not sure how you extract yeah. that, but. And I will say if it seems like we're picking on um, Chiloean uh, folklore, on Time Suck, we have covered Norse mythology oh. and we have covered mythology from so It's all crazy. And there's all, in all of it, whether you go to Asia, Europe, yeah. South America, there are moments where, you know, with kind of what we know now and our view of the worldview now, it's really hard not to just start laughing because it's so absurd. Sure, sure. And it's, I mean, it's laughs and good fun. You yeah. know, it's not yeah. like, I'm like, okay, I mean, if that's your thing, have at it. It's mm-hmm. not my thing. Uh, when you were talking about the like, get naked and run around the island, then I wrote down, this is a weird gang initiation. Mm-hmm. And then you said soon thereafter, like, they just think that, I mean, there are some people that believe that yeah. it's, it's a little mafia down there. A lot, of, a lot of the skeptics just thought that the, this a group of people basically were taking using local folklore mm-hmm. to take advantage of local residents and scare them into thinking that if they didn't pay tributes, then these you know warlocks were going to ruin their lives. Right. And that is what I tend to believe with this particular story as well. Seems the most mm-hmm. probable. That they're like, okay, we, we can scare the shit. We can dress up like uh, witch doctors and, yeah. and we can understand the lore. And I mean, 
I mean, there are versions of that that go throughout around the world. I mean, there are definitely yeah. churches in the Western world that today oh my God. use fear to extract money from their congregations. Sure, of course. You know, so it's just a different version of what is probably happening there. I, I'm pretty sure uh, when you referenced a journalist, um, you said she wrote for Fedora's Travel. Fedora's. But you said Fedora. And it was Oh, Fedora. Awesome. Fedora is like the hat. I know. I was like. I meant, uh, is it it's, Fedora? It's Fedora. Fedor. I think it's F O D O R. F O D O R. I think it's F O D O R. No, no, no. Not F O D O R. No E in there. F O D O R. Yep. Yeah. And how do you say it? I, I thought it was Fodor. It probably is. I probably had the. Uh, or or Fodor. I probably had the emphasis. On the wrong syllable? I, yep, on the wrong syllable. Yeah. But I did love when you said Fedora. I was like, <clears throat> okay. She wrote for Fedora's travel guide. <laughs> she wrote for people who like hats. Mm -hmm. That'd be a very specific travel guide. You can only wear Fedoras. World travelers who love Fedoras. Well, there is a contingency of that. Mm -hmm. There's bar. They point out bars you can go to, or other uh -huh. people like fedoras. And then the, fedora and, friendly hotels. And then they have like uh, a competition, like a, like a feud with like people who wear mm -hmm. newsboy caps. Like, oof, mm -hmm. don't don't go over there. There's a lot of wind warnings. Like, st <laughs> <laughs> stay away from this park. You know, <laughs> don't, don't walk to the edge of this cliff. They never go to Scotland. You might lose your fedora. Yeah. Oh my God! Can't go to Chicago. No, no, no. That's it. Chicago Fed doesn't Fedora's show up gone. on my Fedora travel guide. My God, that would be so funny. Uh huh. Now, how does a Layla daddy choose? <laughs> a Layla daddy <laughs> choose master which... of the Laylas. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have like uh, like master of puppets in my head. Um, how how are you going to choose amongst your children? Mm. Who, whom to bring know, into just... your lap for this story? <laughs> It sounds, I'm just, uh, you know, who's who's speaking to me? Um, and be gentle if you take the broken one. Yeah, broken one's gonna stay up there. I'm gonna take this little red one. Okay, red guy. Mm -hmm, red, mm -hmm. red gal. I think they're well. No, well, they're like non-binary. Maybe I don't know. They don't actually have private parts. We gave them the name. That'd be Layla. super weird if they did have private parts. <laughs> if these little voodoo dolls had either tits or dicks, um, that would be I'm a different. I'm just saying that doll. I don't think that Lay we gave Layla the name Layla. We made Layla a girl. We made her a female. <laughs> we did. Yeah, well, but uh, it's, yeah. there's no there's no definitive mm -mm. feature that says they go one way or the other. So mm -mm, like minions. Oh, <gasps> oh my God, they're minions. They're little be voodoo, voodoo, be -doo, be -doo. little voodoo, 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 <gasps> little voodoo minions. Oh my God, I love it. Can we be <laughs> Layla's for Halloween this year? You remember? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, help us remember. We are going to be Layla's. That'd be. Oh, man, I don't know how how we'd get this costume together, but that would be fun if we could pull it off. Come on, it's not that hard. It's mostly face paint. Yeah. We just have to, like... And like in, a onesie. In a non-offensive way, mm -hmm. paint our skin a different color. Ugh. <laughs> I know. But, I mean... We could be purple. Let's go with the purple. I, know, I was like, oh. Pick a safe color. Yeah. We could be purple, and we can just get black markers and mark up our faces. Mm -hmm. And... um, What is on her chest? A heart. A little heart. Come on. We could wear black contacts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Could be cool. This could be cool. <laughs> For this, I don't know, like, no one outside of this show is going to know what's going on, so we can only do it on the episode. But we, we got to figure out, maybe we can do another virtual Halloween show. And we okay, can dress would you up, guys like that? And we could dress up that way for the show. Okay, that'd be fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we have it. Okay. Now that I'm done with that. Okay. Let's talk about the Crescent Hotel. Mm-hmm. What do you remember? Norman about Baker. Baker, Baker, touchdown maker. Is he related to Baker Mayfield? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, I do remember the Crescent Hotel. It's, okay, give us a little recap if you can. I don't remember the name of the city it's in in Arkansas, but it's in the Ozarks. Eureka? Eureka Springs. I do remember. Nailed it. Yeah. I was going to cover that, so good job. It's Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and it was um, it started off as, I want to say, uh, yeah, started off as a hotel. Then they, in the, in the I, I want to say in the late 1800s, and then it became like a woman's boarding school. Mm -hmm. And then eventually in the late 1930s, this dude, Norman Baker, took it over. And he was a, 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 nice a, guy. a charlatan. Oh. But also like, um, you know, like he would pretend to be like a mentalist. and He had different cons he was running. He was mm -hmm. like a known con man. Mm -hmm. and, and, he, uh, and he started, he, he sold it this spot as a kind of like a miracle hospital mm -hmm. where he came up with a special concoction based on the spring water and other random ingredients and he could cure cancer and he could cure anything and then he had like a radio station back when people could just randomly build their own radio stations and what a weird thing mm -hmm, and broadcast uh this is before i think the the amount of faa or would it be not faa uh there's a regulatory body for radio stations 
FAA is airplanes. But I anyway, know, I was like, I'm very confused right now. FCC. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, FCC is yeah. who? Oh, yeah. You know how I know that? Hmm. Eminem. The FCC won't let me be. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he would, he got all these people to come there. And then there's like these rumors. I don't know how much these were confirmed, but that he would, you know, like, uh, we talked about this in the other scared of death story, like inject just kind of like mad scientist. And he would inject this concoction in uh, various parts of people's bodies, depending on what they claimed, like even in their eyeballs, <gasps> different things. Uh, sometimes they would be shrieking and screaming. And then supposedly they would get wheeled away into the psychiatric ward area of the hospital he had. And according to the legends, a lot of those people would disappear. And they think that their, they think that their bodies were kind of sent down to the basement where he had kind of like HH home style, his own little crematorium oh and God. would, like you know uh get rid of the bodies down there that i think 99 percent sure all of that is pretty accurate okay so, so and because of that there are there's like ghost tours there and there are spirits that are supposedly from these torturous days of this guy running this fucking madman's laboratory there and there's also like ghosts that are associated with other areas of like the hotel and the women's school when did you start saying laboratory I just think it's funny to say it that way, laboratory. Okay, okay. So you were doing that in a stand-up bit? So when it's I'm old, like, old-timey, I yeah. like to say it, laboratory. You've been saying it in a stand-up bit mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about uh, Steve Jobs, maybe? Bill Gates. Bill Gates. I knew it was Heads one down of those his geniuses. laboratory and messes with his beakers. I know. I know. <laughs> but then ever since then, you mm -hmm. I've not heard you say laboratory. I'm like, oh, so is this, are we going with this now? Or are we going hard on laboratory? I'm going to add to it. I'm going to, instead of in the mornings, I'm like, uh, I'll see you later, uh, Bearcat. I'm going to head down to the gymnasium. Okay. <laughs> I can hear Logan laughing. <laughs> but that actually, that see you later, Bearcat. That sounds like a weird, like a uh, vintage T-shirt I would buy, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. like a white ringer tee mm -hmm. with like you know the Bayside Bear face on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My gosh. Okay. Me and some of the boys can head out of the gymnasium, and uh, I don't even know what they would say. They wouldn't say pump iron back then. I don't know what they'd say. I don't know. Do our calisthenics? <gasps> Who knows? You'll figure it out. You'll let us know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the Crescent Hotel and see how your information holds up against what okay. experience our fan has. Greetings, Dan and Lindsay. I'm a new listener and I'm already obsessed. I found your podcast about a week ago and I've already listened to probably 60 episodes. Are you sleeping? <laughs> uh, I listen all day while I'm at work. You guys make the spoopy stuff funny. I'm now going through the old episodes and listening from the beginning. I wanted to share my experience with you of a place I visited and you had an episode about in 2020. I live in Arkansas and have been to the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs a few times, so I thought I would share my most scariest encounter with you. When I was in high school, sometime, sometime around 1997 or 1998, a friend and I stopped by Eureka Springs and the Crescent Hotel on our way home from Silver Dollar City, an amusement park in Branson, Missouri. We took a detour to Eureka just to see the Crescent. The Crescent Hotel sits atop a mountain, and it's not only beautiful in its own right, but the view from the top is spectacular. The roads, to Eureka, the, the roads in Eureka Springs are tiny and wind through the mountains. This adds to the mystery and the beauty of the setting, as well as adding to the anticipation of possibly seeing the paranormal. When my friend and I walked around, we didn't take the ghost tour, which is available at the Crescent, but because it starts after 9pm and we still had to drive the rest of the way home, we didn't do it. I had never heard of the Crescent Hotel until my friend mentioned it that day and didn't even know about its history. I don't think I even looked up the history until years later. She had heard the Crescent was haunted and convinced me we should see for ourselves. We took an elevator to the top floor and explored the hotel from the top down. On the top floor, there's an outdoor par patio area where you can go outside and look through a telescope at the mountains. It felt magical. The view was stunning. Nothing felt scary or even ominous. When we finished taking in the view, we explored the halls. There are staircases at either end of the hallway. We took the stairs, walking down the long straight hallway to the staircase at the opposite side and went down the stairs to the end to the next floor. So zigzagging. We did this all the way from the top floor down. When we got to the second floor, we looked down an empty hallway. We began our journey down the hallway. We had gone about halfway down the hallway when I heard a male voice yell behind us, Hey! What are you doing? We spun around quickly thinking that we were in trouble, seeing as we were two teenage girls wandering around a hotel without permission. Only we found the hallway was empty. It was daytime, probably about 4 or 5 p.m. Since there was no one there, we decided it was probably not someone talking to us and that they had gone into one of the rooms. 
We kept going when I then heard the same voice again. Hey, what are you doing? This... T- <laughs> oh, sorry. Dan Cummins. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, man. You are fired. Okay. I can't believe I didn't have it. I do not disturb. I always have my phone. I do not Who are you? Uh, we kept going when I heard the same voice again. Hey, what are you doing? This time, coming from the opposite end of the hallway. Was someone messing with us? If someone was at one of the staircases on the second floor with us, then they would have had to go up or down one floor, run the length of the hotel, then come back to the second floor to yell from the other side. There simply wasn't enough time to do that from where they, where we heard the first hey to then where we heard the second hey. I was creeped out. Continuing down the second floor hall, we came across a room padlocked shut from the outside. Weird, but maybe they had turned one of the hotel rooms into a storage area or possibly the room was undergoing renovations. I could hear sounds though coming from inside the room. I got closer. I put my ear up against the door. It sounded like a typewriter, but if someone is in there, how are they getting out? Again, the door had been padlocked from the outside. Ear against the door, I listened to the click, 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 click of what sounded like someone typing on a typewriter. The sound went on for several seconds. My friend continued on without me, when suddenly there was a massive bang, as if someone on the other side of the door was not happy about me listening and had slammed their hand up against the door. I jumped and ran back and went to catch up with my friend. I told her what had just happened. She didn't believe me, of course. And then we heard it again. Hey, what are you doing? Coming from the other end of the hall, in fact, the initial place where it had come from, I begged my friend to leave. I was totally freaked out. She pointed out that there were just two more floors to explore, the first floor and the basement. I reluctantly agreed and continued our self-guided tour. Nothing happened on the first floor, and then we continued to the basement. The basement had a completely different feeling. It's dark, cold, and has an ominous feeling. It felt like how a Dementor attack is described Mm -hmm. in Harry Potter, as if all the happiness had gone out from the world. I felt like we were being watched, and whatever was watching did not want us there. I started to tear up. My friend noticed my distress and finally agreed that we could leave. Once in the car, I sobbed and begged her to never go back. Further down the road, I was able to relax. A few years later, I told this story to a group of friends. They, of course, wanted to go see the action for themselves, and as much as and as much persuade and after much persuasion, I reluctantly agreed to go along so some so long as someone stayed awake with me all night afterwards. I made it clear I would not go back to the basement. During this visit, we paid to take the ghost tour, where I learned the hotel's sordid past. During the tour, they did go to the basement, but I skipped that part and waited upstairs for the group to return. Later, my friends told me that they had learned what the basement that the basement was the morgue during Norman Baker's time. Yikes. Mm. Why did I agree to come back here? Nothing supernatural happened during, during the tour, and we made our way back to our room, and slowly, all my friends drifted off to sleep, leaving me alone and very awake. It was one of the longest nights of my life. I was terrified all night, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. And in the morning, I scolded them all for leaving me awake by myself. They were irritated with me that nothing paranormal had happened during their visit. Sorry, can't make the spirits come out to play. I have gone back a few times over the years and have never experienced anything else. I hope you enjoyed my story. I mean, yeah, that's those stories are those, you know, are similar to the the stories we talked about. That's what that, I thought. Mm-hmm, in that Crescent Hotel episode. So very interesting that like they then went there and experienced some things themselves. Yeah. Did, e- did you want to take a phone call? Yeah, sorry. I uh, <laughs> I can't believe I didn't have it on to disturb. So I, I do apologize. It's okay. It's okay. 150 episodes in. Normally you don't even bring your phone in here. I know, but then I, I know like last episode, like it was nice to be able to like look up things quickly as we were going. True, true. And then I was like, well, that was kind of handy. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll just bring it back. I mean, just for that, not to like, you know, check anything. And I just, now <laughs> if I'm going to do that, I have to know. Dan's like no longer engaged in the show. He's no, just over he's, here checking Facebook, Instagram. I have seen people do that on podcasts and it blows my mind. What? Where they just get so comfortable, I guess, just having a more conversational based podcast that they are, um, you know, just like, ch- like we'll check their phone, like a message will come in and they'll just like check it. It's like not on anything, you know, we've done. Yeah. But like, you know, so many podcasts are on YouTube. Every mm-hmm, once in a while mm-hmm. you'll see that happen. It's like, are you serious? 
You're that checked out? I mean, even like with our kids, you know, they both obviously have phones at this age. I'll be like, mm-hmm. you know, if it's our week or if I'm anticipating a call or something from them, I'm like, hey, daddy and I are going in to record. Like, if you need something, Jogan and Jogan, Joe and Logan are right. out in the office. Yep, like, you can, you con- like, if there's an emergency, otherwise, you know, I'll let you know when we're out. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I guess like if you, the only instance in which I can see it is a childcare thing, mm-hmm. or if you are dealing with some sort of like very sick family member, or yeah. like you're awaiting some sort of something very important that, I mean, your life takes precedence over a podcast, but. Right, but if it's like checking like, your hey, Snap, bro, what's Snapchat for feed, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you, want, <laughs> you want to grab a beer later? <laughs> like, piss off. Mm-hmm, pretty rude. Okay, now because I am a slightly paranoid person, yeah. I just have to say, not paranoid, I just like, um, sometimes I say things then I regret it. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about the Layla's. I won't be able to stop thinking about this for like weeks okay. now. Like I didn't mean to be offensive when I said they're non-binary. I don't even think I used that I, term correctly. I will obsess about it oh, for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. I'll be waiting for the email. <laughs> I'll be waiting for someone to yell at me. So right. I just want to say like, I, I don't think I used that term correctly. I wasn't being flippant. And like, I just, I have to address that right away. I thought you I thought you did use it correctly. I don't know, but I get so anxious about like not using it correctly, using it correctly. And well, I, I know that it's the vocal minority. I've talked to plenty mm-hmm. of friends who live in various different spaces in their lives. Yeah. And I've talked to our children who live in different spaces than we live in and mm-hmm. all these different things. And it's like, and I'm not outing anyone by saying that. I'm just saying yeah. they process things differently than I do. And I always try to be so aware and so sensitive. And what I have learned is that if you think you got it wrong or you think you fucked it up, you should just own it. So, like, I didn't mean anything by that. I just, you know, it just just came out of my mouth. And now it's like that entire story all I was thinking about was that word. So I really Uh, apologize for being, like, not the best storyteller in that moment. Oh, I thought you were fine. The story, the story was. It's good. like upsetting me so much. Yeah, it was your. Well, I, I don't think you should worry about that kind of stuff. I uh, I have stopped worrying about things like that where I know my intentions. Yeah. And, and if I get something slightly wrong, and if somebody wants to correct me, that's great. I welcome that. Yeah. Please correct me. But if it's going to be like you asshole, how dare you? I'll just fucking throw your email in the trash because it's like that is the wrong way to go about that. It, right. y- use those as teaching moments. Be like, hey, yeah, I'm I know not you, trying I, to be no, no, cruel. Yeah. So I'm like saying from the person, like whatever it is, if you're offended by anything, you know, just in life, not just on the yeah. show, you're going to have a lot more success if you approach it with like, hey, I, I know you probably didn't I mean know. anything by it, but um, just so you know, this is offensive for X, Y, and Z reasons. That uh, that appeals to people's compassion, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. But if it's a real snappy of like, listen, you need to never like, it's like a scolding tone, or really, I'm like, nope. Not my mom, not my dad. Uh, uh, you know, like, yeah, not not the right way to teach. Well, and also, like, if I deserve a scolding, there's there are people, well, yes, and there yes. are people that deserve if you're doing it, it. If you're doing it maliciously, yes, but I know that there you're are people not, are homophobic. You know that I'm and, not. Yeah. you know all, all the phobics. And I think our listeners, I think our listeners, I know, but I just feel bad. That's the kind of person I am. You know that. You know, which is good. But you, I think they know that we. Um, Never try to be malicious with that kind of stuff. I would, I hope, I hope they know that. They, I think they do. But, you know, yeah. every once in a while an email comes in and then it's like, you can get a thousand emails about how much somebody loves you. And then that one that's like, fuck you. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh God, I'm the worst person ever. And or, it just. Or they're a dickhead. I know, I know. But, you know, <laughs> compassion is like a thing for me. So, whew, sorry. I just had to like, if I didn't, I literally like wrote it down because I'm oh, like, yeah. I can't. Oh, good. That's good. I can't let you're, it go. You're a sweet person. I know. For better or worse. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, should we have one more story then? Let's do it. With our friends, Layla. Let's uh, tell your story, bigot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear Logan out there, but he has the best laugh. And like when you really get him, it's just so great because it's such a good, joyous belly <laughs> yeah. laugh. He should His his laugh should be like laugh track laugh because it's so authentic instead yeah. of like the nonsense that they use for laugh tracks. <laughs> How's, how's your Layla holding up? Good. Do you need to like swap for another Layla? Like we don't want to leave the other children I, I, feeling left I out. I someone else's attention. Okay. You used a brown Layla. So like, now are you going like well, purple, I like to, black, I like, red? I like to take one. You know what? This is actually a weird thing. I was a kid talking about like weird compassion or whatever. Yeah. But like, and it, this is nonsense. Obviously, I know that they're inanimate objects. Oh my God. I think I know what you're going to say. But I, I didn't want to pick one that if I picked it, it would leave another one alone. Okay. Because it made me <laughs> it made me feel better to know that all of the Layla's are at least touching one of the Layla. But I would have weird things like that as a kid in me my too. mind where I'd be like playing with G.I. Joe's mm-hmm. and I feel like I had been too hard on one of my G.I. Joe's. <laughs> and I somehow my brain like worried about that G.I. Joe being upset. Okay. Which is insane. It's insane. Let me tell you how I've yeah. taken that one step further when I was a child. Yeah. 
Mac and cheese is still my favorite comfort food. Okay. This okay. <laughs> is so stupid. If I made a box of mac and cheese and uh-huh. then I went to go throw the box away, I'd be like breaking it down to put it in the recyclables. Okay. If there was a noodle left inside, I, I was- so sad for that. That noodle didn't get to realize its purpose. <laughs> it got separated from its noodle family. And just, it just threw it away. It never got a chance to be a real noodle. <laughs> Not even that. I would just I would be like, oh, that noodle's so sad. It's all alone. That noodle's going to die alone. Like I would work <laughs> myself <laughs> <laughs> Some so, noodle in the tomorrow, tomorrow. I'll be noodle a noodle you. tomorrow. <laughs> oh God! Oh my gosh! I sure hope a rat eats me at the land. Oh. What is it? Land? No, I landfill. Landfill. <laughs> the <laughs> the land at least mine? get eaten. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I was gonna God. say land pile. <laughs> well, you know what? Noodles probably aren't very smart, so it could be land pile. Sure hope a rat eats me at the land pile. Oh. And then you'd be like, that's why I didn't eat you. You're a stupid noodle. I would be so sad for it. Sometimes I would just eat the hard noodle. <laughs> <laughs> that's See, funny. My empathy started at a very young age, okay? <laughs> but when you said about G.I. Joe's, that did make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, okay. Let's get back into the scary. All right. All right. We, we broke this week up with a lot of laughs. Lax, the, your very first story, like, I think it threw me so emotionally. It was so mm-hmm. scary. It was so emotional that, like, my defense mechanism for the rest of the show was like, let's not be too scary. <laughs> okay. Fair. <sighs> okay. Um, oh, man. Well, leading into it, I, I, I write my own intros, of course. It's pretty rare that we have a sad paranormal tale to tell this week, but we do. It's interesting and spoopy, but definitely sad. Okay. So apparently I was like prepping for this. Um, okay. So while listening, while reading this story, I was like, oh my God, this is great. This is great. And then the ending is like, ooh, that is okay. That's unfortunate. But it is like a weird thing. And I really just want you to like hone in on these dreams that this person has and what it leads to because i really want to explore at the end why you think what happened happened because i have a definite theory okay and i'm curious if you'll get there on your own or if you'll come up with something else okay it's a great story great story you ready to ready to head to kenya ready all right let's do it hey king and queen of the suck writing writing to you all the way from across the ocean in nairobi kenya cool bumped into Time suck on Dan's worst podcast player ever, Google Podcast, <sighs> yeah. and was soon sucked into scared to death. And now I'm terrified of walking outside my house without a cross, holy water, and some crystals in case I bump into something. It is a quite long one, and I apologize for any inconvenience. Never. I have always been a believer in the supernatural. Even before I could fully comprehend what they were definitively, I knew something was out there. I was raised in a Christian-inclined household, and so talking of shadows from the closet and things of that nature wasn't quite welcomed. I could feel and see things move in my room at night. Things magically moved inside our home. But of course, which African parent was going to believe some dark shadow did it? So instead, my siblings and I were punished for making a mess. Whenever I mentioned them to any parental figure, my mom, dad, uncles, aunties, grandma, and even my Christian union patron in high school, the answer was always to pray. And you guessed, it didn't work. Maybe my faith wasn't strong enough. To be fair, I was obsessed with everything supernatural, and I mean everything. I don't want to participate in anything, but the curious cat in me loved reading up on things, and my time on the family computer was spent basically researching the difference between the occult and a cult, and finding out if the Illuminati was real. For a while, (laughs) I strongly started believing that I was transferring the things that I read and watched in movies into real life. And so, when a child kept appearing at the foot of my bed, I would turn back around and go back to sleep. When I saw her at my school, always just far enough that I knew it was her but never actually saw her, or at home, sitting with me, watching TV, I mostly ignored her. After all, it was all in my imagination and it wouldn't hurt me. But just in case, I always had my trusted armor, Blanky, tucked under my chin and the blood of the lamb apparently to protect me. I was good. I slept with the Bible under my pillow, and if my family believed in rosaries, I would have had them hanging from each corner of my bed. The older I grew, the easier it became to explain the things I saw, why I felt cold sometimes, or the voice that I would hear time and time again. But one incident changed my view. I was about eight at the time. I remember going to bed feeling very uneasy, like I was going to be sick. I remember telling my mom, but like every good parent, she pointed out that I wanted to extend my weekend and I wasn't fooling her. No, she isn't cruel. I had just pulled that sick card one too many times before. I woke up before my alarm and didn't want to get out of bed. 
I felt heavy, like something bad was going to happen. As my dad took me to school, we witnessed a road accident. This guy was hit by a truck and his body was still out on the road. I could see his brains. And this was all before 7 a.m. As we passed by, a cold wind blew and I could swear I heard someone laugh in my ear and say, this could have been you. But I shrugged it off as my conscience as my conscience warning me to be more careful along the road. That day could easily have been the worst day of life. I got in trouble for everything I did at school, and any African out there can attest that trouble in school means wax from your teacher and then possibly your parents when you get home, because why would you embarrass them like that? Didn't they raise you better? Uh, evening came, and my friends and I were walking to the bus stop. It was quite a distance from the school, approximately two or three kilometers. There were closer bus stops, but the bus fare would have been much higher, so we walked the one closest to the highway and got cheaper transportation. Sometimes we even hitchhike. Anyways, we were walking, and right as we approached where the morning guy had been run over, I decided to cross the road and avoid that spot completely. I was in the middle of the road, and I felt a weight on my feet, like someone was holding me back from walking. Now remember, this is a busy highway. There are trucks with logs on them coming down the road, matatus, which we call our public transportation vans, buses, and motorcycles. But there I was, stuck. I couldn't lift my foot off the ground. Uh, the drivers were hooting nonstop. I could hear people yell at me to move off the road. There was a truck that was coming fast towards me. I think the people around me must have thought I was frozen in fear. I was more afraid of being run over than by whatever was holding my leg. And finally, after an enduring curse, after enduring curses and verbal abuse from the drivers, a friend of mine, Rue, pulled me off the road and whatever it was that held my foot let go and we went tumbling down the road, still on the freeway, still on the highway. Needless to say, aside from the bruises I got from the tarmac road, I was okay. I avoided being run over by a motorcycle and was seconds away from being crushed by a truck that I later came to learn had lost control. Rue asked me later if my foot had been stuck by gum or something. He said he too felt the weight when he tried to pull me, but I didn't have an answer. Of course, I didn't dare tell my parents lest I was whooped for playing in the road. That very evening, my sister and I walked... Uh, my sister and I were taking food to my dad's best friend, our uncle Seb. He and my dad worked in the same institution, and he lived three doors down from us. In, uh, every evening, at about 7.30, we would take him food because he couldn't cook to save his life. That night, we were late. I had just finished my... I just had to finish my homework before I walked out, because with my ADHD brain, I wouldn't have finished it otherwise. So at about 8, my sister and I took his food and walked to the house. The air was colder than usual, but it's as if I was the only one who could feel the pinch of the cold in the air. My sister, who has chest issues, seemed to breathe just fine. I felt my stomach drop. Something wasn't right. I felt sick again, but I shook it off and walked to his door. We were welcomed by the sounds of Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. We walked on in, calling out to Uncle Seb. Uncle Seb! Uncle Seb! But no response. I walked into his room, and there he was still in his suit, one shoe on, one shoe off, the tie strewn on the bed. He looked like he was sleeping, except he wasn't ever going to wake up. I walked back out to find my sister in the living room going through his things as we usually would. I told her that he was gone, and her screams alerted everyone around us. My plan had been to go find my father because daddy knows everything, but in a short while, all the neighbors thought Uncle Seb was being murdered due to all the screaming. A little girl came rushing out to find me standing in the doorway, my sister rolling around on the ground, which is relatively n normal behavior on our side of the country. I couldn't even open my mouth as they carried him out, covered in a blanket. But I heard that same voice. It could have been you. I was eight at the time, and of course I didn't pay attention to it. Later, I went on to research the angel of death, trying to figure out if it had a target on me or something, because not two months later, the same thing happened. Same sickly feeling, the coldness despite the glaring sun, and just as myself and a neighbor of mine crossed a road, a truck carrying lumber for the paper factory came down the road. I jumped into a ditch to save myself, and when I made it out, I realized five people had been killed, including my neighbor. That Jeez. voice was louder this time, always like it's in the wind, but also in my mind. It could have been you. In high school, there was a girl I cannot say I knew well at all. I remember her name, though, Lauren. Every time I was around her, in the same area as her, I would start humming, It Is Well With My Soul, a song many on this side of the world consider to be a funeral song. Two months later, 
She got sick and she died on the surgery table. I got worried, was I killing people? And if I was, how come I didn't channel it to people I at least hated? Then the game switched and I started having these weird dreams. A child, the same kid I had seen at the foot of my bed when I was a child, would walk with me, holding my hand, pointing things out to me. It was weird because none of it made sense as they were random objects without any context. The kid didn't speak, ever. She pointed to the toilet in one of our dorms, and then later that week, one of the girls in my school had an abortion and lost the, and tossed the baby away in those bathrooms. Then she pointed to the hallway in another door, dorm not too long after some people claimed to have countered a ghost or spirit of some sort. She pointed to a male teacher, and then he died soon after from cancer. I couldn't stop these dreams. They didn't come every night, but when they did, I was holding my breath because shit was about to go down. Then one night, the girl showed me a woman dressed in a white pantsuit, her hair up in a ponytail, and for some reason, she was at my grandmother's house. She had this weird smile on her face that put me on edge. I had never seen this woman before. I looked down at the child, and she held up a danger sign, the first ever real communication in a sense. Did this woman want to harm my grandmother? Who was she? When was she coming? I was off at boarding school, so if this woman showed up, I had no way of knowing. And I couldn't tell anyone because what was I going to say? The kid in my dreams told me? Three weeks later, my school organized a trip to the Bahamas of Kenya. It was a 10-hour drive, so we were going to spend uh, half a week out of school. Music to my ears. That night, the kid came back and showed me the woman again. Now, I was freaking out, but I had no way of communicating what I saw, and I didn't even know what it meant. On the way from school to Bahamas, there is a black spot along the road. As we approached said black spot, a white double cabin truck pulled up and in the driver's seat was the same woman from my dream. She turned, looked straight at me, and that smile almost drove me to insanity. I thought I was projecting a bad dream, but my teacher, who was also our chaperone, saw the same thing as did a couple friends on the bus with us. Except I was freaking out about this lady and no one else could understand why. My teacher asked the driver to pull over, and for about 20 minutes, I just let out everything, mostly just the dreams. We prayed because, of course, isn't that always the solution? Not a kilometer later, that white truck was in an accident on the highway with another bus. Ten people who would have been seated in the same place I was if our bus hadn't pulled over had been badly injured and three had died. Again, the voice came back. It could have been you. A month later, the kid in my dreams told me her name, Maya. Four years later, I got pregnant, and Maya would come to my room every night and lay with me. Sometimes during the day when I napped, I would feel her with me. Never threatening, though. She was like a guardian angel of some sort. I lost my baby in the seventh month, and the night that I did, I heard this beautiful orchestra singing, I'll be missing you. And in my dream, Maya and my baby, who I had also decided to name Maya, were walking away together. It's been eight years, and I've yet to have another dream. Keep on sucking, keep on scaring. It lets me know I'm not the only freak show on this planet. Love and light, rain. That is an extraordinary amount of death that surrounded rain. I mean, that's intense. Like so many instances of like uh, multiple people dying and these crazy mm -hmm. car accidents and neighbors and just like her being like around it and so close to it, so close to death so often. Well, so I feel like terrible for her. And I think, I mean, some of it I would say I think is like, you know, um, circumstance of where yeah. rain lives, you know, sure. where it's like, not that people don't die crossing traffic here, but like the way our road system is, is, is obviously so very different. So the amount of road deaths in yeah. Kenya, as opposed to the amount of road deaths here, I would imagine are, I are very different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it's just like, you know, it's just, yeah, it just that was just an unusual uh, yeah. thing. I wasn't expecting. I was like, man, mm -hmm. there was like a, a, a lot of instances but then again, like, I just think about, like, my own childhood. Yeah, you had a lot, too. And, and yeah. that's come from my perspective where I didn't have many growing up. Which I'm like, right. man, rain was... And, yeah. and, and then just yeah, my so brother many... and I had, like, a thing of, like, it was, like, 30 deaths in 30 days. Man, yeah. It's just, like, some fucking weird nonsense. And then, like, the like the premonitions or, or, or the visions mm -hmm. uh, that got connected to all these. And, mm -hmm. the, and, the, and the figure from the dream initially that just kept showing up later mm -hmm. on. Yeah. I don't know what all that means. Okay, so this is the theory that I wrote down. I yeah. wonder if baby like child maya ghost That's in the dream 
Child, yeah, yeah, yeah. From the from the beginning, mm-hmm. the, the little kid that kept showing up at the foot of the bed, mm-hmm. who like kind of like goes away and comes back. Mm-hmm. Was that always Maya's voice saying it could have been you, and uh-huh. not like a not a curse of like not a um, not a like it should have been you, right? But like it could have been you, but I'm protecting yeah, you. Because she said guardian angel towards the end, and it's like it, that's what I thought before she said that. I was like, what is this? Some kind of like guardian angel, like just protecting her this entire time. Mm-hmm. And then I also wondered by the end if ghost Maya, let's just call it for ease, Mm -hmm. if ghost Maya was lonely, if ghost Maya maybe, I don't want to say took Rain's baby. Right, that's pretty creepy. It is, but it's like, was like ghost Maya not wanting to be alone? Was Rain going to have a very difficult pregnancy? I mean, people, women die in pregnancy, in birth. Is ghost Maya a monster and that's the payment? I don't know. Like keeping you safe, I take your baby. I mean, maybe I wasn't going there. I was just going to like, you know, maybe Ghost Maya knew that Rain would die during child labor. And women die during child labor far more often than anyone realizes. Yeah, I I guess I think about that like way in the past, but it still happens fairly regularly, right? Which uh, is terrifying. Yeah. Since you have your phone, you could look up the statistics because I don't know Mm -hmm. them. And I now that I've said that out loud, I wish I would have. But it is far more common than even. uh, And I don't mean like in developing countries. I mean, here in the United States. It's a terrifying number. Deaths during child childbirth? In the U.S. Just like as a, a number. Okay, you, you, with you, you, you got to keep Google? talking. You got to okay. keep talking. Okay, I thought it was going to come up really fast. Uh, no, it takes me a second to type. <laughs> oh, you are a slow typer man. But anyways, I just wonder if Maya, if ghost Maya possibly knew that Rain was going to have complications during her childbirth. So could she have come and saved Rain? Like it could have been you, but Hmm. took her baby away instead? Or the baby was going to have complications and the baby would die at birth? And so while it's devastating and heartbreaking, and I can't imagine the amount of emotional, mental, physical, spiritual agony a person goes through after carrying a life for so long to then lose a life, you know, but it's like, was she, was Ghost Maya trying to protect Rain in some way? Was she trying to protect Baby Maya? Or was she some terrible evil entity that meant to say it should have been you? Was it always trying know. to get Rain and so it took her baby uh, instead? Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. 750 to 1,000 deaths per year. That's a crazy number. Mm-hmm, for tw- the modern age, yeah. In 2022. Yeah. When it's like, you just, people just think like, oh, I'm going to have not, once I mean, you get pregnant, you find out how dangerous it is. It, it, it breaks down to about, um, you know, 20 to 25 deaths per 100,000 live births. That's so crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mm-hmm. crazy in in this first world country mm-hmm. Where, mm-hmm. where most births are taking p- place in hospitals with doctors. Even if you're choosing to, you know, yeah. do a home birth with a midwife, it's like, I mean, it, we have yeah. such technology now. I can't, I, it should be zero. It should be zero, you know, or like one in one freaking million yeah you know but uh yeah so i don't know i i, I it was just a That's odd. A, yeah very interesting story i mean i, I mean it's, it's uh i liked it i liked it not, not i don't like what different. happened no but yeah but different pacing the way it was um written yeah um it was enthralling well and then and then maya never comes back so once she gets baby maya that's it she hasn't come back in eight years so ghost yeah. maya is now off with baby maya and, and maybe there's some peace for you rain that like yeah, i hope rain is not surrounded by uh, Continual death. death. Yeah, now. Well, and maybe there's peace in knowing like the spirit that was always with her in her childhood and in her life until she became pregnant uh, is now caring after the child that she didn't get to give birth to. I mean, uh, I don't know. Like maybe there's some weird, sweet, poetic justice to that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it's just a very different story. Um, would you like to start off our Annabelle shout outs or would you like me to tonight, this time? You know what? I'm here. I'm ready. No, Let's do okay. it. Okay. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, Lena. Oh boy. I should have given this one to Dan. Grekichin. Lena Greshikin. Heather Marie. Colby Alvis. Elena. Caitlin Fouch. Holly Medrano Stevens. Oh boy. Orbitoclasmic. Orbitoclasmic. Okay. Mm, birth name. Uh, Daniel Gehring, Mercedes Nicole, Ryan Lechte. <laughs> Feel special yet? <laughs> Stephanie uh, Bachel, Jerry Seplina, Death Stare 13, Noah Black, Caleb Reibolt, Crystal Jensen, Noah Ireton, Pacman and Chelsba, Paige Belvins, Philip Graves, Jesse Presswood, Danielle Thompson, Hayden O'Brien, and Lexi Scott. Thank you, Annabelle's. And I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's as well. Holly Rippey, 
Jennifer Kinney, Laura Grace Lay, Tori Klee, or Tori Cly, Chad Haggard, Susanna Cuevas, Eric Arp, Kayla Giese, Corgi Mom, <laughs> Jennifer and Darren Power, Skyler and Carrie Smolos, Jeremy Coffey, Mariah Vossler, Dustin Miller, Heather Bliss, Nakaya Wyatt, Ryan Gentry, Taylor Brown, Alex Lisi, Heather Barber, Leah Maxwell, William Dexter Crawford, Lindsay's Cancelled, Acacia, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> I hear Logan laughing Mark, so hard. Mark Rogers, Mallory Thornhill. I think I gave you my names for this week because I oh, had okay. all the hard ones. <laughs> you did. Do you have some <laughs> shout outs? I do. I have just a few this week. Oh, sweet mama Lucy sends a happy first birthday to her child who has the coolest name, but also I am worried I'm about to butcher it. Sumire Morningstar Nomoto. Did I get that right? I hope I did. <laughs> uh, to Shayna from Jess, happy birthday from your all-time favorite cousin and fellow creeper. And to Saba from Mia, congrats and I love you. This is so sweet. Two sisters who have both individually been trying to get pregnant. They are simultaneously pregnant. Oh man, how lucky. I know. We'll have babies within moments of one another. Oh wow. I know. What a cool thing. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, and that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks, Logan Keith, Liz Hernandez, for the work on social media. Uh, Logan for running badmagicmerch.com and producing and directing today. Zach Cohen, thank you for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Thanks to book editor Drew Atana for polishing, preparing the listener stories for book number three. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week and to Sarah Finch for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want pictures from the show and more content at Scared to Death Podcast. And you can check out our fi- private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers. And if you don't want more ads, if you want uh, monthly bonus episodes to contribute to our charities and more, uh, subscribe to us on Patreon. And enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Thanks for sticking with us for 150 episodes. Woohoo! Hope you were scared to death. Bye, y'all. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions.